What's the connection between a man-eating shark, a homesick extraterrestrial, and a Nazi hunting archaeologist? Nazis. I hate these guys. If you're a movie buff, you're obviously thinking Spielberg. Duh. And you're right. But the connection goes deeper than that. Turns out, the sharks, the aliens, even the dinosaurs, all of them have something to say about Spielberg's Jewish identity. Sure, Spielberg's never been shy about exploring Jewish themes in his movies. We are talking about the guy who made Schindler's List, but his relationship to Judaism shows up in unexpected ways in all of his films. I hear the skeptics. E.T.? A movie about Jews? Can't be. You can't be Jewish. Absolutely. And actually, my question goes even deeper. Could Spielberg's conflicted relationship with Judaism be the secret to his incredible success? Humans often turn to art to express strong emotions. That's why so many of us have written embarrassing high school poetry that we hope never sees the light of day. The cat sat on the mat. Well, Spielberg isn't any different, except instead of bad poetry, he worked out his emotions through film, and he had a lot of complex, changing emotions about his Jewish identity. This was a kid who was born a year after the Holocaust and learned his numbers by examining the tattoos of local Holocaust survivors. As a three-year-old, he had no idea that the men and women gathered around his family's table in Cincinnati had survived a genocide. To him, they were just nice old folks with numbers on their arms who came to his grandma's house to learn English. This was his normal. I'm not a psychologist, but this feels like a pretty obvious explanation for a lot of Spielberg's works. When you grow up in the shadow of that kind of trauma, you tend to revisit it. But the Holocaust wasn't Spielberg's only experience with Jewish trauma. His family moved around constantly for his father's work. It's hard enough for a kid to be uprooted and have to constantly readjust. It's harder when you're the only Jewish kid in your neighborhood. Like a lot of artists, Spielberg got picked on a lot. His bullies zeroed in on the main thing that made him stand out, his Judaism. Eventually, Spielberg started to associate his Jewish identity with shame. I still feel ashamed of myself even remembering that long stretch of my life where um, I didn't want to be Jewish anymore. That's what happens when you're the only fill in the blank and you have no pop culture representation, no one who looks or believes or talks like you on the big or small screens. Bond. James Bond. Showing you that it's okay to be different. I doubt Jewish representation was top of mind for Spielberg when he was making his first blockbuster. Jaws has exactly zero explicitly Jewish characters. And yet, I'd argue that Jewish themes power the film. We'll start with the shark itself. Spielberg has said that when he first read the book that the movie is based on, he found himself rooting not for the townspeople, but for the shark. What did you say? Think about it. Jaws is the prototypical outsider in the lily white beach town where nothing is ever supposed to go wrong. It's a pretty apt metaphor for how the world has viewed Jews over the centuries. Or to be honest, any capital O other that threatens the status quo. In fact, some critics interpret the shark as a metaphor for communism, which in the 1970s topped the list of foreign things Americans didn't like. Side note, that interpretation fits neatly with the idea of the shark as Jewish, given the anti-Semitic theory that Jews invented communism to take down world governments. Man, sometimes I wish we had a fraction of the power that anti-Semites think we do. But the shark calls up an even more explicit anti-Semitic trope. He's a violent figure that hacks apart innocent women and kids. In other words, he's exactly what anti-Semites believe Jews to be, a lurking menace thirsty for Christian blood. If you're, you know, sane, you might be like, do people actually believe that Jews drink blood? I'm sorry to say that they sure do. That conspiracy theory is called a blood libel, and it's been used as a pretext to slaughter Jews for hundreds of years. Famously, the shark doesn't show up on screen until late in the film. He's scary precisely because you don't see much of him. The townspeople, rightfully, are terrified. But how many of them have actually seen the shark? Daisy, Daisy, this is Hendrix. Anything? Thought I saw a shadow, over. And how many of the people who believe blood libels have actually ever met a Jew? There aren't that many of us. The space we take up in anti-Semites' heads is vastly disproportionate to the space we take up in the actual world. This explanation only goes so far, though. Because unlike the Jews accused of blood libels throughout the centuries, the shark does in fact eat people. He actually is the bad guy, even if he's just following his sharky instincts. But the shark isn't the only symbol of Jewish identity or fear of the other in the film. In their fight back against the shark, the townspeople bring in an expert oceanographer, 
Matt Hooper, who is heavily implied to be Jewish. Who are you? Matt Hooper. I'm from the uh, Oceanographic Institute. Oh, for Christ's sakes, you're the guy we called. Like the shark he's paid to study, and like Spielberg himself, Hooper is an outsider, a city boy among the working class townsfolk. Gentlemen, the officer asked me to tell you that you're overloading that boat. He's the proverbial wandering Jew, cursed to travel from town to town, never fully welcome anywhere. He's brilliant and quick thinking, and spoiler, he ultimately saves the town, but he's not a part of it, and he never will be. Spielberg returned to this theme of alienation in his next movie, Close Encounters of the Third Kind. Yes, pun intended. But this time, he drew inspiration from the Hebrew Bible. The film's main character, Roy Neary, is a mashup between Moses, who led the Israelites out of Egypt, and Elijah, a Hebrew prophet who ascends to heaven in a chariot of fire. Like Moses, Neri has to contend with a bunch of skeptics who doubt and mock him at every turn. Now there are all kinds of ideas that would be fun to believe in. Mental telepathy, time travel, immortality, even Santa Claus. Much like the Israelites, who spent a significant portion of the Exodus doubting and complaining about, well, everything. We're dying out here. My wife's not happy, that's for certain. Didn't you do anything? And like the prophet Elijah, Neri is eventually taken up into the heavens, though his fiery chariot is a UFO piloted by aliens. But you know, minor differences. Aliens as a metaphor for alienation? It's too easy, man. But it was Spielberg's next movie that really hammered the point home. E.T. the Extraterrestrial centers on a homesick alien who befriends a lonely little boy named Elliot loosely based on Spielberg himself. The movie's main characters are lonely and isolated, desperate for connection. They find it in one another, but that connection is threatened by powerful forces who want E.T. gone. He's an outsider, literally. He's a man from outer space, and we're taking him to a spaceship. And that makes him dangerous. Sound familiar? Spielberg later noted that E.T. is the ultimate minority story, but the power of telling stories is that we get to choose how they end. Ultimately, E.T. offers us a vision for a better world. E.T. and Elliot learn to communicate with one another. Their shared language leads to an empathy that transcends their differences. I'll be right here. But Spielberg wasn't quite ready to celebrate his own differences. Four years after E.T., he produced an American tale, which tells the story of a Russian Jewish family that immigrates to America due to anti-Semitic persecution. Yep. Just a normal kids movie about anti-Semitic mob violence. But this isn't exactly cinema verite. The Jewish characters are animated mice who sing songs like, There are no cats in America and the streets are paved with cheese. The cats are an obvious stand-in for the very real Cossack mobs that rampaged through the Russian empire throughout the 19th and 20th centuries. Sounds pretty Jewish, right? But some critics panned an American tale. This seems to be a Jewish parable that doesn't want to declare itself. And they start out this story, and it is a Jewish story, and then they chicken out and leave it all alone. Lots of mixed animal metaphors there. It's pretty telling that at the end of the film, the main character assimilates, turning into a real American. And while that was the goal for many Jewish immigrants to America at the turn of the century, I think it's really depressing because it conceptualizes Judaism as embarrassing ethnic baggage that should be shed as soon as possible in order to be like everyone else. I'd argue that for a while, that was what Spielberg really wanted, to be like everyone else. This is the guy who made Raiders of the Lost Ark, in which a Nazi hunting archeologist played by a Jewish actor hunts down the Jewish Ark of the Covenant. And yet, there's not a single word in the script about Judaism or Jewish identity. It's a pretty glaring omission in a movie that seems tailor-made for Jewish audiences. It's possible Spielberg would have continued making movies that talk around Judaism rather than about it. But everything changed when his second wife converted to Judaism. This was the turning point in his career. As he watched his wife consciously choose the identity that had brought him so much shame, he was forced to examine deeply and explicitly what it meant to be Jewish. Until that moment, Spielberg had played it safe, making movies about generalized themes of alienation and assimilation. But Schindler's List wasn't going to beat around the bush. Spielberg later reflected that making Schindler changed his life. I was hit in the face with my personal life, my upbringing, my Jewishness, the stories my grandparents told me about the Shoah. And Jewish life came pouring back into my heart. I cried all the time. There's a lot more to being Jewish than processing intergenerational trauma. 
Still, nothing forces you to confront your complicated feelings about your identity, like standing in a death camp that was built to exterminate your people. The film brought a flood of survivors to Spielberg's door, each with a heartbreaking story. Painfully aware that survivors wouldn't live forever, Spielberg created the Shoah Foundation, which filmed thousands of hours of survivors' testimony. Spielberg had never hidden his Judaism, but now he was owning it, loudly, unashamed. Schindler's List won Spielberg his first Oscar. And the Oscar for the best picture of 1993 goes to Schindler's List. Steven Spielberg, Gerald Molin, and Branko Luswick producers. Let me just say, there are 350,000 survivors of the Holocaust alive today. I implore all the educators who are watching this program to please do not allow the Holocaust to remain a footnote in history. Please teach this in your schools. Please listen to the words and the echoes and the ghosts, and please teach this in your schools. Thank you very, very much for this. But it was his childhood rabbi's backhanded praise that really cements the film's importance. He called it Stephen's gift to his mother, his people, and in a sense, to himself. Now, he is a full human being. Honestly, ouch. The Jews of Schindler's List are utterly powerless, dependent on the generosity and moral compass of their non-Jewish employer. But by the 21st century, this was no longer the Jewish experience. Israel had been around for decades, simultaneously vulnerable and tough as hell. So Spielberg turned his attention to a different facet of modern Jewish identity, power. His film Munich follows the Mossad agents who hunt down the Palestinian terrorists behind the 1972 massacre of Israeli Olympic athletes. But this isn't your run-of-the-mill thriller. Spielberg's Mossad agents start off full of righteous and avenging anger. They end up questioning everything, including the razor-thin line between justice and revenge. There's no peace at the end of this, no matter what you believe. The film condemns the torture and slaughter of the Israeli athletes, but doesn't let the Mossad off the hook. And unsurprisingly, Jewish organizations were less than thrilled with the Mossad's portrayal. Some even called for a boycott of the film. Honestly, in my mind, that's the most Jewish thing about it. The commotion and debate it stirred among Jews, because that's part of the Jewish story too. We've never fully agreed on anything. Our relationship to power and to Israel is no exception. But if Schindler's List and Munich examine the Jewish people's relationship to trauma and power, Spielberg's latest film explores his own personal relationship to his Jewish identity. That's what I want for Hanukkah. What? Christmas lights. <laughs> Sorry, darling. Jews don't get Christmas lights. The Fablemans is based on Spielberg's life. He calls it $40 million of therapy. If Jaws, E.T., and Close Encounters had alluded to his childhood alienation, the Fableman spells it out loud and clear. This is my life. This is my story. This is my identity. I told you he's a kike. He doesn't like Jews. <laughs> Nobody likes Jews. <laughs> Except other Jews, right? Spielberg isn't young anymore. The guy was born in 1946. But his legendary career is the best proof that we never stop grappling with our identities. Age doesn't automatically bring certainty. In some ways, that's terrifying. But it's also kind of reassuring because it means that we never stop growing. We never have to stop being surprised and fascinated by life. People go to the movies for a lot of reasons. Entertainment, escapism, a need to see ourselves reflected on the big screen, a desire for a language to express the things we don't know how to say. And whether you love them or hate them, Spielberg's movies fulfill all of those needs. His most critically acclaimed films don't shy away from exploring heavy topics. They are specific, detailed, and personal. They stare head on at all the things that make him who he is. The alienation, the shame, the pain of being an outsider, all of which are directly bound up in his Jewish identity. But like Judaism, his films also celebrate how big and beautiful and sweeping and complicated life can be. They balance trauma with hope, pain with love. So it doesn't matter if he's writing about sharks or aliens or animated mice. He's got the secret sauce, curiosity, willingness to explore, and above all, a commitment to asking the tough questions, which in my book is the most Jewish trait of all.